Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today at Medscape. Uh, we're excited to bring you some content in the sphere of wellness. Uh, my name is Indu Subramanian. I'm a neurologist here at UCLA, and I run a Center of Excellence in the Veterans Administration on Parkinson's disease. And I'm just so excited to have uh, my friend and colleague and mentor, uh, Jennifer Bickle, uh, join us today. Um, she is the uh, Chief Wellness Officer at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Florida um, at the University of South Florida. She's a professor of oncological sciences there, and she's also the chair at the AN Wellness uh, Subcommittee. Um, so that's the American Academy of Neurology's Wellness Subcommittee. And she just brings so much um, great uh, um, practical information and zest for life and just, um, you know, is a wealth of information. So, so just excited to have you, Jennifer. Welcome. Oh, thank you, Indu. I'm, I'm quite excited to talk to you about this today. People are a little bit tired in some ways of, of this topic, right? They're like another burnout lecture, like, oh no, great. What are we going to learn from that? And I think people are burned out of hearing about burnout, right? But, um, you know, you have such a an excitement for this space. And I think we both have a background in wellness. I know you've, you're acupuncture trained. You've done a lot of training um, in the integrative medicine world, as have I. Um, can you tell me a little bit about, you know, what in your career path led you to this? Well, I can tell you that for most of my career, I would have rolled my eyes at the idea of a chief wellness officer, right? You know, um, I would have assumed that that would be somebody walking the halls with like wearing crystals and giving high fives and, and all that sort of stuff. But but in reality, what really drove me to it was um, the same thing that pulled me into medicine in the first place is, is, a, is a calling to be a healer. And also because I believe so much in healthcare, I believe so much in the role of physicians, um, nurses, you know, all of us who have dedicated our lives to improving the health of our community. Maybe I didn't always know how to name it burnout, but seeing through the years about how the lack of wellness um, contributed towards people leaving the field, contributed towards patient safety errors, mental health stigma, and so much of what we have within the healthcare environment that I started to find myself kind of pulled in this position that I never thought I would go into. I always thought that I would be, I'm a headache medicine specialist, neurologist. I always saw myself as a clinician, maybe an educator, not an administrator. And here I am now predominantly in administration, I'm helping to lead the system changes that are necessary to um, reduce burnout and improve well-being. And that is all through the intention of improving the health of our communities. That's a, a laudable goal. Um, maybe before we move on, let's like define burnout. What does it actually mean? People can spend several hours kind of nitpicking what the definition of burnout is, what it is, what it isn't, where the Venn diagram, Venn diagram overlaps with depression, when it doesn't, all of those sorts of things. But I really like the World Health Organization that categorizes it in the way that, for example, depersonalization. Um, we know that we're going to be less likely to see patients, we're maybe more likely to see them as their disease state rather than the whole entity that they are in front of them. Um, and by the way, that also is the same way that we don't de de just depersonalize our patients, we might depersonalize leaders or people from other departments. We depersonalize those who are, are, are separate from us. Um, also just a, um, a, a feeling, a sense of uh, fatigue or lack of accomplishment. Um, all of us have worked 24-hour shifts. We've had, you know, really rough times and you come home tired. But what I'm referencing here is that sense of just pure exhaustion that you don't really have much more, a sense of being overwhelmed, you know, and um, and then is is sometimes just a general sense of um, cynicism. You know, um, I, I think of this almost in line with some of the, the um, learned helplessness or whatnot, but basically along the lines of that, um, it's harder to find solutions to problems, right? It's it's easier to see that there, um, it's easier to look uh, towards the problems or um, to critique possible solutions than it is to be innovative and creative. One of the things that I think as a, as a doctor, sometimes when we go to work, we have a sense that people don't value us, that we don't feel appreciated, having no control, having responsibility, having sick patients, having lack of autonomy, sometimes feeling like you're just another cog in the wheel. These things can lead to, you know, I think some of the things that we've talked about. I know you've spent hours and hours, you told me, talking to people yeah. just like me, just like our viewers who are are facing some of these issues. So tell me a little bit about what you learned and, and create this framework for us. You know, it sometimes reminds me of um, parenting that you, you sometimes know more about parenting until you become a parent. And then you're just like, oh, wait, this is there's there's a lot more to this. Right. I, I, I thought it was so clear ahead of time. And that's kind of how my um, story has been getting into burnout, that to me, I felt like there was these very clear drivers that needed to be fixed. And I just needed to show up and fix them and, and get other people to buy in and, and do their work to fix those things. And it's not totally inaccurate. But the truth is, is that. Um, uh, burnout, um, though we all have opinions on the drivers of burnout, 
burnout is incredibly complex. It has national drivers, organizational drivers, team drivers, and individual drivers, right? There's the resilience aspect of it, but then there's also top of the license work aspects of it. It's um, uh, how we live our life with our values. There are so many different potential drivers and also potential solutions to burnout. And this is why I think that it's incredibly important. And one of the things that I've um, really emphasized at my own organization is that when we're trying to address burnout, that we don't show up with just our passionate opinions, but instead we look towards some of those expert models. I was um, fortunate enough to be a part of the National Academy of Medicine Action Collaborative on Clinician Wellbeing, which is really about looking at those national models about how we can improve well-being. Um, the U.S. Surgeon General has also put information out. And for physicians, the AMA has a joy in medicine framework that really enables people to look at all the different areas of what needs to be done to improve well-being. So I would say that it's incredibly important for people to understand that there are expert guided frameworks out there that they don't have to reinvent the wheel, nor should they, quite honestly. You reference the hundreds of hours, like I, I have an open door policy. And I and I, when I think about it, um, I have literally spent between four to four to 500 hours in one-on-ones with people listening to sort of the, and, and not as a counselor, not as something like that, but really as sort of just discussions around burnout and um, what are some of the drivers of their burnout and what are some of the solutions they would like to see. And then my um, partner here at Moffitt, uh, Dr. Dorda Heimbeck, she's a PhD that has also done wellness coaching and supported people in a lot of different ways. And so we combine sort of those themes that we were hearing quite a bit and um, what we figured out was that um, what I always say is that it's basically about the 40 minute mark that I'm talking to someone that it whatever it is that they're upset about usually comes back to a sense of not feeling valued. Right. That, for example, um, I'm, I'm really upset about this EHR change because I'm not being valued in how I'm using my time or prior authorization. We usually think of prior authorization as being about the administrative burden part of it which is true. It's not top of the license work and it is an administrative burden, but also they're questioning my medical skills, right? I, I went through years of training and then additional board certification. And now suddenly you don't trust me to even prescribe a routine medication. There is a sense of not feeling valued. And then it, especially as we're starting to see even our patients who we are trying to serve are questioning our, um, our experience more and more as we start to see disinformation spread through social media and other avenues, again, how we might not feel valued. And so really, this is where we built upon um, the five languages of appreciation work, which is really great and used in a lot of different um, uh, um, industries. But we built upon that in order to really figure out what our APPs and our physicians wanted specifically to feel valued and appreciated. And those included things such as autonomy, right, or uh, transparent efforts to reduce the frustrations of my day or inclusion in decisions that affect me or signs of trust in my medical skills or one of the top ones, which reemphasizes why we got all we all got, went into medicine in the first place was positive feedback from my um, from my patients and their families about my clinical care. Right. Um, and that that matters more to us than and then a lot of times what we see as far as the the organizations that we may work with that when they think of their key performance metrics, um, though those are useful and they are important. They're not always the same metrics that feed our souls into why we went into medicine in the first place. And so we need to do a better job of communicating that. Some of these things seem very simple, right? In some yeah. ways, but we all like, you know, that thank you card or to have other people realize that we did something special for our, our patients. But, you know, sometimes these things get lost in the shuffle. We need um, to establish a cultural connection and yeah. support. Some of my work has been in loneliness and Parkinson's uh, patients, but um, I think this is such a universal sort of um, mantra that we're sort of giving to everyone is that they need to find friends. They need to find ways that they can kind of decompress from their workday and talk to someone about, you know, you know, what their struggles are and to realize that they're not alone. Right. And so how are you guys sort of um, helping people to do that? That's a fantastic question. And, and your work on loneliness has been um really inspiring in a lot of ways because it's 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 part of the ways of of healing people that we don't always talk about right like um writing the prescriptions for the social connection all of those things right and when i think about it from um a, a medical standpoint is that um it's interesting that in december of 2019 the new england journal of medicine had an article about the epidemic of loneliness amongst physicians december of 2019 before the pandemic even had, right? And so it was already there. It was already there that people were spending more time with their um, with their computers than they were with connection. 
And what's interesting about lonely people is that they typically think that they're the only ones that are lonely, right? And and that's part of what the condition does is it it makes you almost question your 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 sanity or or um or that there are others like you. And um, we know that, for example, that physicians, um, uh, despite being among some of the most successful, um, successful, you know, most accomplished people out there, that they are more likely than the general public to think that they are not accomplished, right? And they are more likely to be more critical with themselves when they make mistakes, and they are less likely to prioritize their own self-care. And I say this because they all combine with an inner dialogue that makes us to think that sometimes we are other than or not worthy of the community that we are in. In addition, I firmly believe that there's a silent curriculum in medicine that is one that does not allow for the showing of vulnerability. We have mistaken stoicism for professionalism, when in reality, things like vulnerability and laughter is actually far more um, beneficial towards our profession than um, the stoic, I can handle it approach, right? So that being said, is that I'm a firm believer in the fact of showing and giving people opportunities to see the humanity of other other individuals is incredibly important. One of the ways that we've done that is by bringing in Schwartz Rounds, which has been present in over 400 organizations for many years. But uh, what it is, is a panel discussion around the common themes that are affecting us within healthcare. So some of the themes that we've had can be around finding a sense of belonging, as a matter of fact. We, we partnered with our enterprise equity team to really talk about that. We've also done navigating uncertainty. Um, and we've done other things of, of, of like, for example, the patient I'll always remember. And we have a multidisciplinary panel in which there are doctors and nurses and non-clinical people, people from different leadership levels, and hundreds of people attend these, and they get to witness the storytelling of individuals. My previous organization, we also did finding meaning in medicine, um, sort of storytelling along that way as well. So, which can be incredibly important. In addition, we've also built what is um, what is a peer support program, because adverse events will occur to the majority of us at some point in our career. It's just going to happen, and no amount of training or protection or anything can keep that possibility from happening. And when something like that has happened, when there has been a negative event that has occurred with a patient it increases our likelihood of not just leaving the organization, but also leaving the field of medicine altogether. This is the same with nursing, APPs, physicians, et cetera. Um, everybody who, because it, it threatens our identity, it threatens our um, sense of security, right? And so what we have found and, and what is um, being really accepted across the country is that just being able to connect with a peer supporter who is trained to give you the support that you need after these events, prevents that risk of burnout, prevents that risk of turnover. And, and, and it's that sense of connection and that person being trained in either like a psychological first aid or stress first aid model so that they're responding in a way that gives you the space to lean into your own resiliency and process it versus what we have a tendency to do when someone comes to us with trouble. We either say, oh, you shouldn't worry about that or, oh, that wasn't your fault or, oh, the same thing happened to me. Let me tell you this story, right? But in reality, if we give people the space to process and the support and the connection that they need, most people can find the post-traumatic growth that they need from those experiences. That's so powerful. Yeah, I did this contemplative fellowship with uh, the New York Zen Center, and we had a number of clinicians, and we shared um, our biggest mistake. And it was so cathartic to listen to these stories, um, and they were universal. I mean, I'm a neurologist. OBGYN, you know, palliative care doctor, didn't matter who it was in the room. Each of us had a story that had transformed us. And it was just pretty magical to listen to these stories and, and realize that we weren't alone. One of the things that happens when we feel alone, when we feel isolated, um, there's a tremendous amount of stigma with, with that. It's like, I'm not likable or some, I'm a loser. Or there's something wrong with me. And we end up sort of isolating even more. I think in, in medicine, from a mental health perspective, I think we've, we've just seen that a lot of our um, fellow clinicians are suffering and that people are, you know, committing suicide at a higher rate. Just wanted to give you a last minute, uh, maybe Jen, to talk about that stigma of mental health. I think that we have this, this silent curriculum that is against self-care. So the way that we show dedication to our work is one of self-sacrifice. And the truth is self-sacrifice is very close to self-destruction in a lot of ways, right? And and being able to get help earlier on is not really part of our um, part of the curriculum that we're taught, right? Um, and that um, I 
I think that in healthcare, we have developed a maladaptive response. Um, I kind of respond to it as maladaptive resiliency. We're able to bounce back, but not bounce back fully, right? Like we show up, but we're not able to be completely there. And I actually think that one of the ways that we decrease the mental health stigma associated with depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts is actually to demonstrate for more of our leaders to show more vulnerability, to demonstrate the importance of self-care. I don't think that it's all just about saying that we should um, de-emphasize, that we should reduce the stigma of mental health. I think that we should reduce the stigma of, of suffering and loneliness and all of those things as well, because the thing is there's, there's no human life that does not include suffering. And the more that we provide some space without it becoming just a complaining session, but we provide more space um, for the dialogue around our vulnerabilities, I think that's actually how we in turn um, uh, reduce some of the stigma that's around mental health. Well, thank you, Jen. Thank you for making the time. I, I appreciate it so much. And, and the fact that you're there being our wellness officer at the AAN is, is very um, exciting to see sort of what the future of, of this whole space holds. Well, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the invitation.